Can your sins be hidden? Can you get away with it? After all, it only affects you, right? We're going to dispel all these myths that Satan will use to get you to think that you can hide sin. Good morning. This is your wake-up call. It's Wake Up Call 096, The Destructive Power of Hidden Sin. I'm your host, AJ. I'm so glad that you're watching and that you're listening to the Faith for My Generation podcast. I want to go to Joshua chapter 7. We're going to take this chapter and look at it um, in detail. And what I would like to do is I would like to read this chapter. We've done this before on the podcast. I'd like to read this chapter and then go back for, back through it and break it down point by point so that we can really see what's going on and so that we can take God's Word to our heart and let it change and form and shape our lives so that we will not suffer from the destructive power of hidden sin. Joshua chapter 7, verse 1. Here we go. I get to be the guy that reads your Bible for the day. Joshua chapter 7, verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things for Achan the son of Carmi, the son of Zebdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the cursed things, so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth-Avon, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up to, the, to attack Ai. Do not weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. Are few. So about 3,000 men went up from there, from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And when the men of Ai struck down about 36 men, they chased them from before the gate as far as Sherbium and struck them down on the descent. Therefore the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh, that we would be content and dwell on the other side of the Jordan. O oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off your name from the cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? So the Lord said to Joshua, Get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned and they have transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived and they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they have become doomed to the destruction. Neither will I be with you any more unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in your midst. O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning there you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that tribe which the Lord shall take come, shall come according to the families, and the family which the Lord takes shall come by households, and the household which the Lord takes shall come man by man. Then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel." So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. He brought the clan of Judah, and he took the family of the Zerites, and he brought the family of the Zerites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. Then he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Now Joshua said to Achan, My son, I beg you, Give glory to the God of Israel and make confession to him and tell me now what you have done and do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel and this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. And there they are, 
hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and there it was, hidden in his tent, with the silver under it. And they took them from the midst of the tent, brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his ox, oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned them with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor, or the Valley of Trouble, to this day. Joshua chapter 7. So I got to be the guy that read your Bible, the audio Bible guy for the day. I, I, <laughs> that was kind of fun. I enjoy doing that. Uh, just a little side note before we get into it. I would love to have my to record the entire Bible, even if it was just to do it and have it. Uh, earlier this year, I live streamed reading the entire New Testament over the course of 21 days. It took about an hour and a half each day doing it. Live streamed it on YouTube and TikTok. So it was interesting. I don't know if I'll do it again in the beginning of this year or not. It was a it was a lot of a lot of reading. Let me tell you, by the end of those twenty one days, uh, my voice was pretty tired. But it was a very good experience. Now, with all that being said, Joshua chapter seven, the destructive power of hidden sin. As what we just read, you can see this is the story, uh, the the literal historical account of Achan, the man who coveted these three items then took them, stole them from the Lord. We're going to see why they were stolen from God. And it brought destruction on him and his family. And obviously, you know, there was other implications of his sin as well. So let's look. Verse 1. The first point I want you to see is this. Sin never just affects you or one person rather. And that's one of the opening questions I had in the beginning monologue. You know, can sin be hidden? Can you get away with it? After all, it only affects you, right? These are three different lies that Satan will speak and try to use to tempt you to fall. Now, why are we talking about this particular passage today? Because when we take the Word of God whether positive or negative, and take the principle from it and apply it to our life, it keeps us from falling short of the promise. It also safeguards our heart, and it makes us temptation-proof. I'm going to show you that just in just a few minutes before we end the episode today, that we can overcome every single temptation. Yes, you heard me right. You don't have to get a Q-tip or clean out your ears. We can overcome every single temptation that cross our path. We absolutely can. Now, first, let's destroy some of these myths. The first myth I wanted to destroy is this. Sin doesn't just affect one person. You might think, well, after all, and that's what Satan wants to tell you. You know, after all, it's just just you. It's not going to harm anyone else. It's not going to have any other effects on anyone. It's just you and your thing. Don't worry about it. After all, think about that with Eve, right? Uh, Satan is deceiving Eve in Genesis chapter 2. And he says, in Genesis 3, did God really say you couldn't eat this? After all, it's pretty. it looks pretty good. And then Eve, she sees that fruit. It looks good to the eye. It looks good to eat and She wants to be wise like God. According to Satan, that's what she could do to be wise like God was to eat that fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 1 John 2 verse 15 says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not from him. Verse 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. All sin can fall, uh, every sin falls into one of those three categories. 
lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. For Eve, every th all three of those were met. She saw that it was pleasant. It looked good. It was good for food. That's the flesh. And it would make her wise. And, and, and so th in that very first time that we see temptation come into humanity in this age of people that God has been working with and has brought redemption to, the people on the planet of what we call Earth, for humanity some 6,000 some odd years that have inhabited this planet. The very first time we see temptation come across to a person, Eve, he says, did God really say this? And he's dealing one-on-one -on -one with Eve, but here's the thing. Eve might think, well, I'm just going to you know, eat, take a bite of this fruit, this forbidden fruit. What's the big deal? But immediately... Her husband follows suit as well. 1 Timothy 2 tells us that Eve was deceived, but Adam was not. Adam made a decision to sin. He knew it was wrong and he did it anyway. But there immediately Eve sins, Adam sins, and then what happens? All of their heirs, all of their descendants, they're birthed into sin. So that sin certainly didn't just affect Eve, and it certainly just didn't affect Eve and Adam. It affected every single person that entered into the earth, that entered into the planet, that was born, progenerated from them, that was, was born of them. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says, Therefore just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. So every single person has been born in sin, with a nature to sin, and then when we commit sin, we fall short of that glory of God. And we're going to commit sin. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God because we have a nature to sin. That's why we must be born again so we can get a new nature. When our nature changes, then our actions will follow suit. But this idea that sin only will affect you is the first lie we have to dispel. Achan thought it was just going to be something he could have. You know, I'm, I, I see this Babylonian garment. Man, that looks good. I would look sharp in that. Oh, some silver and some gold. That would be nice as well. Let me just cut. He coveted those things first. That's the eighth commandment out of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not covet. He did. Ooh, I want that for me. And then he stole. Or it's, that's the Tenth Commandment is covet. He stole is the Eighth Commandment. He took that which was designated to God. In the book of Leviticus, there's a law that says that that which is vowed to God, it is an accursed thing. In other words, it's the Lord's, and for anyone to take it is to thieve, to steal from God. And in jo Joshua chapter 7, we see it wasn't just Achan that sinned. It says the children of Israel committed a trespass. God said, wait a minute, there's sin in the camp. I can't bring victory to all of you while there's sin amongst you. Second thing I want you to see is this. Sin makes what should be easy very difficult. Now, in verses 2 through 5, Joshua sends out some scouts to this little town named Ai. And when they come back, they tell the general, Joshua, don't send up the entire army. This is a small city. Just send two or 3,000 of us. We'll wipe them out, no problem. Well, when these two or 3,000 men go, or verse 4, these 3,000 men go, they're immediately, immediately turn tail and they're fleeing before this little country town of Ai. And so what should have been an easy victory, an easy win, became their first defeat. And in fact, 36 men are killed. So again, to that first point, sin doesn't just affect one person. Sin always contaminates, hurts, destroys, affects other people around them. You know, you think about it uh, in between spouses, husband and wife. If a husband or a wife is unfaithful, it's not just them committing a sin of adultery. It also hurts their spouse. And if they're a parents, their children, and then if they're, you know, a, their family around them. So one sin that they think they can hide and get away with, it not just destroys them, it destroys the marriage, it destroys the family fabric, and then their other extended family, and then their reputation, and then the call of God on their life. 
the 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 respect that once was attributed to them it's gone and 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 then when they try to do something great and wonderful for the Lord there's that area of their life that they have to mend back together of course repent of it first and then rebuild so this idea never let this idea creep into your mind that well you know sin God after all God will forgive me yes when we repent and we confess of our sins God will forgive us when we actually truly repent and confess when we turn from those things not living in them You can't live in sin and also repent of it. It's impossible. To repent is to turn from it. And when we do that, 1 John 1, 9, let me read that. 1 John 1, verse 9, powerful, powerful promise. Keep it in your heart. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So notice, When we confess, He's faithful and just to forgive and cleanse. But to confess, to repent, is to turn from it. And when we turn from it, then we have to go about the business of rebuilding. And so don't just get so hung up in the idea, well, God forgives, don't worry about it, God forgives. Yes, He does. But there are natural consequences that have to be endured sometimes, overcome sometimes rebuilt sometimes or sometimes they're never gone. In this instance, these 36 men aren't coming back. And it's because of Achan's sin. And then the second thing we see here, what should have been easy, sin made it difficult. Let me tell you something. Don't play with sin. It will make your life very, very, very hard. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is very hard hard. The way of the transgressor, it's a hard path. It's a hard life to live. But you know, the life that we, you and I live, it's easy and light. Matthew 11, Jesus tells us that his burden is easy and his yoke is light to follow him. Now as we continue on, verses 6 through 9, after this defeat takes place, and again, this is the first defeat that Israel has experienced. They've left Egypt, and they've been under the leadership of Moses. Now they're under the leadership of Joshua. They just defeated this massive city named Jericho. They've come up on a little city. Should have been an easy win, but that's where they experienced their first defeat and the first deaths, and really the only time people die when Israel is in warfare is because of sin, because they did something wrong, because they disobeyed God. But this situation here, Joshua, he's awestruck. He doesn't know what to do. He's he's thinking, why did this happen? Why did this happen? So verses 6 through 9, Joshua goes to the God. Now look, notice, you should run to God. You should turn to the Lord. When that destructive power of sin, or quote-unquote hidden sin, which there's no such thing as hidden sin. We're going to see that in a second. But that destructive power of hidden sin, when it begins to work, the very first thing you should do is run to God and repent. But Joshua doesn't know what's going on yet, right? And he's not the one that did the sinning, but he's the one experiencing the consequence of this sin in his army and in his nation. And so he's going before the Lord, and honestly, Joshua, there's a little bit of good in what he's praying, but then there's also some very similar murmuring, it sounds like. Joshua is saying to God, you know, why would you bring us across the Jordan if we were just going to die? It kind of sounds like what the Israelites were saying to Moses. Why would you bring us into the wilderness? We could have died in Egypt. At least we could have eaten onions and leeks and fish in Egypt, but now we're going to die over here, and it's going to just be this manna stuff. Joshua saying, why did you bring us across the Jordan if we were going to fail? Why did you bring us out here if all the Canaanites are going to hear it and cut all, off our name? And then what about you, Lord? What about you too? Joshua turned to God, but unfortunately, there was an, uh, he was insinuating. He was basically saying, Lord, it's your fault. Think about it. Joshua was saying, God, why did you bring us here to be defeated? Because in his mind, he's done everything right, and he has. But he made this assumption. He made this assumption that it must have been God bringing him to defeat. Let me tell you something. 
God always has your best in mind. Jeremiah 29, verse 13, God tells us that He has good plans. In fact, let me read that. Jeremiah 29, 13, very popular verse. Jeremiah 29, 11, excuse me. 13 is the powerful prayer promise. promise. 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now, of course, Jeremiah is speaking that directly to the Israelites who were in captivity. But he's telling them, this is what God desires for you, but you have to go into this period of 70 years of captivity because of judgment for sin. But the general principle is still true for all people because God is not a respecter of persons. He's not, he doesn't play favorites. And so what God desires for us is peace, not evil, a good future, and hope. And so always, always, always... Know and keep in your heart and your mind, God has my best planned for me. So if my best isn't taking place, mm, is there something I've been hiding sinful in my life that I need to come clean and get rid of? But Joshua makes this assumption, well, it must be God doing it. No, God, God had the best for Israel in mind. So what does God tell him to do? Verses 10 through 12 God tells him specifically the cause of defeat. He tells him, hey, look. In fact, God tells him in verse 10, get up. Why are you on your face? Why are you laying there on your face crying and weeping before the ark of the Lord? The ark being a, an, a, a box overlaid with gold, cherubim on the top over this mercy seat. The idea there is the ark is the throne of God. And so that's where Moses and then now Joshua and then people later would go to speak directly to God. Joshua being able to stand before the ark was a was very, very, very precious uh, right to do that because at, eventually only the high priest would stand before the ark of the covenant and would only do it on one day, the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, which is in the month of September. And that would be the day where he would take blood of an innocent lamb put it on the mercy seat for the atonement or for the debt payment of the sins of Israel. And so for Joshua to stand in this place was a very holy thing. It was a very precious thing for him to do. Not anyone could just do this, couldn't just walk up to this ark, to the Ark of the Covenant and be there. But Joshua was, and he's pleading before God. And then God finally says, okay, look, get up, get off your face. This is the reason these 36 men are dead. This is the reason you lost today. This is the reason this little town whipped you. There's sin in your camp. See, that's the second myth we destroy. You can't hide sin. You might be able to hide it from people, but you can't hide it from God. And sincerely, honestly, uh, I, I, you know, I'm not insinuating everyone has hidden sin by any means. I'm not saying that. But if you're listening and you've got something you've been trying to hide, notice I said trying to hide, let me just tell you, it's not hidden. You may hide it from other people, but you don't hide it from God. And I'm also saying that for all of us to hear. Don't let Satan lie to you. Oh, don't worry about it. No one will ever know. No one will know if you take that extra money on the job. No one's going to know. I mean, no one checks the books. After all, you check the book. No one's going to know if you follow that account on TikTok. No one's going to know. Don't worry about it. No one will ever find out. That is a lie of the devil. He's trying to make you think there'll be no consequence for sin. And he's trying to make you think that you can do something wrong and get away with it. And that, my friend, is impossible. Because the Lord says specifically, I'm going to show you who it is. Verses 14 and 15, the Lord says, "Go. I'm going to send you out there tomorrow morning. You're going to pick the tribe then the family, then the household, then the man. I'm going to take you right down to the spot, to the root of sin. And that's another thing we need to understand. The symptoms or the consequences of sin are, 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 sin are out here, and that's what affects our life. But in order to get rid of these consequences of the sin, we have to get down to the root of the sin and get that thing out of our life. It's just like in John 15 where Jesus said, I'm the true vine and you are the branches. And any branch that is bearing fruit, I'm going to prune so that it bears more fruit. And that should be our prayer, Lord. Prune us. <laughs> prune me, Lord, 
so that I can bear more fruit. In other words, me as a branch, you as a branch attached to the true vine. If there's anything in me not like Jesus, cut it away so that I can bear more fruit. Now, verse 13, God commands Joshua, sanctify, get up and sanctify the people. What does it mean to sanctify? Sanctify means to be set apart. It means to be set apart. Uh, a, a month or so ago, I preached a message at church, Gospel Tabernacle, the church I pastor at, uh, talking about holiness. Be ye holy is, was the message of it. And we, we, we did the replay of the live service here on the podcast. You can check it out. But in that message, we talk about what's the difference between being sanctified and holy. Uh, and we talked about what sanctify is. Sanctify simply means to be set apart. Things can be set apart. You know, if you have silverware in a drawer in your kitchen, those utensils have been sanctified. You don't dig holes with the forks and spoons. You might could. They would be a terrible shovel. But you don't do that. You don't use the forks and spoons in the garage working on the car. You don't use them to clean stuff. I mean, they're set apart in the drawer so that when you sit down to eat, you can grab those utensils and eat. That's what sanctify means. It means to be set apart. What God's saying here is set Israel apart. So get ready, get ceremonial, ceremonially clean because I, God, I'm going to search through these people and we're going to find this accursed thing. And then, of course, as we mentioned, Joshua is given instruction on how to find sin. Look, Proverbs 28, 13. Oh, this is a good, this is a good passage to keep, to keep in your heart and your mind. Proverbs 28, 13 says this. He who covers sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Let me read that one more time. Proverbs 28, 13. He who covers his sins will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Sin will always find you out. It is best, the best policy. If you do something wrong toward God, toward man, the best policy is to instantly, quickly, repent, come clean. That's when you'll get mercy. That's when you'll get mercy. So then they, Joshua wakes up the next day, calls out Israel, and they go breaking it down, tribe, family, household, man, and Achan is the man that they find. Now, I want to read one more time what Achan took. Verse 21, Achan said, When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them, and there they are hidden in the earth in the midst of the tent with my silver under it. He stole a beautiful robe, a garment, and a very costly robe, I'm certain. It says beautiful Babylonian garment. Who knows, maybe it was... The king of Jericho, for all we know. Maybe it was his own robe. Some silver and some gold. Now, we don't know how much this robe costs. It's hard to value it. But the silver and gold, depending on the trading commodities, $15,000, $20,000. Maybe the garment itself would be, I don't know, if you were to go get a hand-tailored suit. I love wearing suits. I don't have a hand-tailored suit. I have some suits that I've taken to a seamstress, and she takes them in. They fit better, and they look great. <laughs> a lot of them are discount suits, and I pride myself in that, getting a really great suit for a great deal. But if you went somewhere, there's a guy I follow on Instagram, Ask O'Kee. He, he's a, the king of the drape. He has a particular style of suits that he cuts. It's actually like, uh, looks like what guys in Americana 1920s, 1930s type suits would wear. Anyway, they're super classic looking. Uh, I was looking just for fun, like, how much does it cost for him to measure you out into him and his guys in his clothing house to cut a suit, sew it up, let you try it on, and in that type of situation, you try it on, then they go through and pull, pull and push and stretch and pull, and then they re-sew some areas do it another time, and they keep doing that until it's a perfect light glove fit. And I always thought to myself, you know, if I got a suit like that, I would have to make sure I never lost or gained weight <laughs> because you're going to have to go get it taken in. That's a whole other ordeal. 
but it was like at a starting prices was like four or five thousand dollars for this. And you go, like, ooh, my goodness, that's a lot of money for one article of clothing. It's a suit, you know, pants and jacket, but come on, I mean, it's still one outfit, right? So maybe this Babylonian garment, you know, in that day and era, maybe it would be something that we could value today of a couple thousand dollars. But still, when it's all said and done, we're not even talking thirty, forty thousand dollars. Now, one hit of that, that's a good chunk of change, obviously. But in America, the average median income or the median income for a household, I think, is forty eight thousand dollars in America. So we're talking about less money than one person or a family would make in one year. Now, I understand that's a whole year, but for you to do this, for him to do this, he loses his life. And, and we're going to cover this in just one second, him and his whole family are killed for this. They're judged righteously by a righteous and holy God. And justice requires the death of them. Now, my goodness, nothing, there is nothing that is worth this type of destruction. And that's what I want to get to. That's the main point I want to get to is sin doesn't pay. When Satan comes along tempting you, you need to have that in the back of your mind. It may sound good, it may feel good. I may want to do it. The flesh, you know, your will, your flesh has a will. First, uh, John 1 13, there's the will of the flesh. Your flesh has a desire. Your mind has a desire. Unrenewed thoughts have desire. And you might think, I want to do this, but let me tell you something. It isn't worth it. Sin is never worth it. Sin is never worth it. It doesn't pay. And as I mentioned, verse 24, we see him and his whole family. They are judged. Righteously so, they are judged. Now you might think, wow, how did the whole family get stoned? That's not right. That's not fair. Well, Deuteronomy 24, 16 tells us this. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor their children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for his own sin. Now you might say, wait a minute, AJ, that doesn't help the situation. Achan's the one that sinned, not his family. Well, we must infer, we must concur that for Joshua to have stoned Achan and his whole family and God not get upset about it, because remember, God is cleansing sin out of the camp of Israel. If this was sinful for him to do this, God would have said, hey, all right, now we've went from coveting and stealing to now you've murdered someone in cold blood, not justly taken the life through capital punishment. You have murdered someone in cold blood. So what we must infer, what we must concur is this. These sons and daughters, they're of age, adult age, and they were in on it. They didn't steal like Achan stole, but they must have known that he did it, and they too kept the secret. That's the only possible conclusion. Because when they were judged, we see that God was righteously, or it, they were righteously judged, and God did not give any correction in this situation. If he did it for Achan, he would have done it in this situation as well. So keep that in mind. And that's so, that is so good. I, honestly, I've read this passage many times and I thought to myself, wow, that's tough. I know if God did it, it's right. But mm, wow, how did that happen? But the more and more you study the Bible, the more and more things click and the more and more things come together. And I saw that when I was studying for this wake-up call. I also want to make this point. If you go to Joshua 6, the chapter right before it, of course Jericho falls, but Rahab and her whole household are saved. So think about it. One person's actions, Rahab, brought salvation to her. Literal, physical salvation. And she marries a Hebrew man and she's in the lineage of David, King David, which means she's in the lineage, her descendants, 
Uh, David is her descendant, but that also means Jesus is as well. <laughs> so Rahab, this Gentile harlot, gets brought into the family of God, literally David and Jesus. But one person's actions, Rahab's actions, brought salvation to her and her whole household. One chapter over, Joshua 7, one man's sin brings destruction to him and his whole household. And that's why you and I, we have to be so guarded about what we think, what we say, what we do. Because whether it's good or bad, it will not just affect us, it will affect those that we love and that are around us. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, and this is what we close with, every single sin you can overcome. Every single temptation, really, is what I should say, you are more than capable to overcome it. You're more than capable to overcome every single temptation. And I, the, the way we want to, or the, I'll, I'll show this to you, 1 Corinthians 10, but first I want to read to you James chapter 1, 12 through 15. I want you to see, <clears throat> the pro, I'm calling it the process of, of sin. James chapter 1 verse 12 verse 13 rather. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So notice, first off, God doesn't tempt anyone with evil. If you're being tempted to do something sinful, it's the devil telling you. It's the devil tempting you. It's the lust of your flesh. It's the lust of the mind. It's the pride of life. But it ain't God. Get that out of your mind. The, the, the test of our faith that God gives opportunity for is never temptation of sin. It is to overcome and to win and be victorious. When there's a temptation, that's of the devil. Now, why are we tempted? Desires. And when those desires are enticed, notice the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So conception, just like a man and woman come together to conceive a child, there's an action taking place. So first it begins with the temptation, the desire. And when you act on that desire and that temptation, then sin is birth. And when sin is full grown, it brings death. So keep this in mind. Temptation and sin are not the same thing. Some people have you know, mentioned or talked to me. I've talked to people about this over the years. Excuse me. They say, you know, I'm having these or I'll have a thought of this or that. Do I need to repent of this? Well, no, you've not sinned. Sin is to take action on the temptation. Just because Satan tempts you with a thought, it's not all thoughts aren't your thoughts. That's a good thing to keep in mind. All thoughts aren't your thoughts. Some thoughts are thoughts that Satan, through the battlefield of the mind, is sending across your mind to tempt you to do this or that. And what you and I must do, we say, no, nah, I'm not going to think of that. In Jesus' name, I refuse. And then you turn your thinking on something good, holy, pure, just. Philippians 4, 8. Because if the temptation remains, it's inevitable you're going to take action on that temptation. It's going to wear you down and you're going to say, ah, I'm just going to do it. And then once you take action on the temptation, that's when it crosses into sin. Now, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So notice, every temptation that comes, God is faithful. He's given us a way of escape. Every time you're tempted, it's no different than anyone else is tempted. All of mankind is equally tempted. It's common to man. What you're experiencing, what I experience, temptation, when Satan tempts, that is completely and totally common. If you get tempted by the devil to sin, congratulations, welcome to 
humanity. <laughs> All people do. All people are, are tempted by the devil. But God is faithful. How so? Well, one, we'll never be tempted with a temptation that we cannot overcome. Every single time you're tempted, you have the power, God-given power as a believer, as an in Christ person. Now, if you're not in Jesus, you, got, you don't have the power to do this. But in Christ, you have the power to overcome every single temptation, every single time. Because God is faithful and He makes a way of escape. So, I heard it said this way. Get rid of sin before sin gets rid of you. And that's, the, that's a whole lot of truth in that. Get rid of sin before sin gets rid of you. Now, I believe, and I believe the best. I believe that most people that are watching and listening, in fact, I'm going to say everyone that's watching and listening, you're living holy unto God, and you're growing closer and closer to the Lord. But if by chance you are listening, and you think, you know what, A.J.? I got some things I need to get rid of. I need some, there's some accounts I'm following that I need to unfollow and block. There's some people that I'm around that I don't need to be around anymore. There's some things I'm doing on the job that I never need to do again. I want to encourage you right now. Make those decisions and by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, follow through on them. Because sin never pays. It only brings destruction. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will make you pay much, 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 much more than you ever wanted to pay. It costs too much. It costs you everything. You know what? Before we finish this episode, let's pray this prayer. If you got some things you need to get rid of in your life, pray this prayer with me. Say, Father, I repent of my sins. Wash me clean. I thank you that you give me power by the Holy Spirit to overcome all temptation. From this day forward, I yield to you. I thank you that you make me an overcomer. And Lord, show me how I need to make this situation in my life right. What should I do? For I want to come clean and be totally and completely right with you. Nothing hidden in Jesus' name. Amen. And take action on that. Don't just pray the prayer. Take action on it. The prayer is the beginning point which we put faith in our spirit. Release it from our spirit. Our faith we release through those words and then we take action on it. Hey, I'm so thankful for each and every one of you. I pray that you would grow only closer to the Lord. Remember, sin does not pay. We're going to walk free from the destructive power of hidden sin always in Jesus' name because we are the faithful. I will see you next time. God bless you.